in the, about the last year at Clearwater has been a major portion of what I've been doing uh, for Clearwater. So what are our goals today? I want to introduce a couple data science and machine learning uh, processes um, and life cycles that you can use if you're interested in uh, doing working on machine learning. I'm going to discuss a project that we've had at Clearwater that we've been uh, recently incorporating uh, machine learning into. And then at the end, I'm going to give a peek into how that project has turned out as a motivation for doing your own uh, machine learning and applying machine learning at what you do. <clears throat> All right, so what is machine learning? You could Google machine learning. You're going to get a lot of different answers. Um, the way that I think of machine learning um, generally, when you have like a, a development project, you have a developer that is encoding what a domain expert thinks should happen. With machine learning, you're pivoting the importance to the domain expert telling you what should happen to the data that is telling you what has happened. Um, that's not always the best thing because maybe not always the best things have been uh, what's actually happened. Um, but you can work around that kind of thing. And I think it's a great way to, to pivot the importance um, so you can say, this is what we've historically done and uh, get the machine to learn from that. All right, so machine learning is good for plenty of things, uh, I think, right? And a lot of people do too. Um, I have some examples here. I'm going to go through them, and I'll talk about how we incorporated these ideas into what we're doing uh, here at Clearwater. So I have a picture of an envelope, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, this represents uh, spam, like spam detection. Um, so spam detection, you're working with text, right? So you need to be able to figure out a way to get the text and present it in such a way for your machine learning model, they can say this is spam or this is not spam, right? So there's all kinds of different ways you can do this. You can do word counts um, and just all kinds of different methods to present the data to your model. It involves feature engineering, pulling things out of the subject line, that kind of thing. So it's definitely a complex problem, but maybe not as complex as the next one, which is uh, like image detection or image uh, classification. That's what the dog is supposed to represent, right? So you have a bunch of images and you say, I would like to be able to say, understand or know what's in this image and classify it. This is more of a complex problem because the things in the images are going to be in different places. Maybe you're going to have two dogs. Um, there's going to be all kinds of complexity that you're going to have to deal with for this. Um, the models that are going to be good for this today are neural nets, right? They're killing it. Um, the reason that they're doing so well is because you can pass all of the information that you have, and through the layers in the neural net, it's going to do its own feature engineering. Um, so you don't have to do as much of that as you generally would have had to do with like the you know, uh, spam detection and pulling things out of the email. And the most complex example we have here is the uh, picture of a car. That's supposed to depict like a self-driving car. Now, self-driving car, as it's barreling down the road, this isn't like one algorithm that's telling it what to do, right? It's a collection of models that are all working uh, in concert to identify and tell the car what to do. So you're going to have like uh, multiple cameras. You're going to have a camera and you're going to have a model that's reading the information off of that camera to say, here's the lines on the road. This is where I need to be within those lines. You're going to have another model that's looking at the, the image and saying, there's obstructions, there's a person, there's these things that I need to know about. You're going to have another model that's identifying you know, what speed you need to do. Excuse me. <clears throat> Um, so that's a very complex problem. It's not solvable with like one model. You need a bunch of models working in concert. And uh, so there's bl definitely plenty of things that machine learning can be used for. <clears throat> These are just a couple examples that I'll come back to. All right, so project goes the way of machine learning. Machine learning is like the hot topic right now, right? Um, so if you're working on a project and you have, you're using a bunch of heuristics to try, try to identify the best way to go, um, maybe you're continuing to stack rules to capture those corner cases. Um, that, that's a great example of a time when you know, maybe we can look at machine learning to solve some of the problems that we're looking at. Uh, the example that I'm going to be talking about, uh, we have a team in Clearwater, their whole purpose is to create a data pipeline. All right? And part of that data pipeline involved uh, like unstructured documents, think HTML or PDFs, that we needed to incorporate that data into the data pipeline. So that's the, the example that I'm going to be talking about today and the lessons that we've learned through that process. <coughs> So how do we generally address problems as people, right? Blue thing, the explosion thing, that's uh, the problem. Something's wrong. We need to fix it. And we want to optimize it. We want to make it better. And we have our tools. Maybe it's a domain-specific language or a different set of rules that you want to apply to the problem to, to solve it. And then you're going to need metrics because you need a way to uh, tell people and yourself that I solved this and here's how I know why. This is why I can tell you that I actually solved this problem. So you're going to have metrics. Now, when you take that 
um, decision or when you make that decision to go to machine learning, you're going to swap out your normal tools and uh, incorporate machine learning tools and machine learning algorithms and those kinds of things. And those come with their own set of metrics, um, accuracy, precision, recall, those kinds of things. So this is how we generally address problems. Now, machine learning and data science, they have their own frameworks for uh, addressing, these, addressing uh, issues and problems. <clears throat> this is the CRISP data mining guide. Um, I ran into this a few years ago, and uh, this document, the original document's from like 1999, so it's older. Um, so this is before we were in the machine learning state that we are today. But there are definitely still things that we can learn from it, all right? So you've got a couple bubbles. You have a business understanding. You need to understand what you're trying to change within the organization. There's some, something wrong and you want to fix it, and you need to understand why you need to fix it so you can figure what you need to do. Then you're going to say, what kind of data do I have available to me? Generally, it's not going to be all right there. You're going to have to collect it from different uh, areas, possibly get some data from outside of the organization. And you're going to do data preparation because data doesn't come clean and ready to go. Now, if you've already been working on a problem and you decide to go to machine learning, you should have an, uh, probably a pretty good idea of where this data exists and possibly what you're going to have to do to it to prepare it for machine learning. <coughs> So once the data is ready to go, uh, you can pass it to the machine learning model. And then you're going to evaluate it to see how well you did. Um, those evaluation metrics, you're going to bounce it back uh, to your business understanding to see if you actually did what you wanted to do. Right? Um, and then you're going to go through the circuit loop, and you're just going to keep doing it because it's a continuous cycle. You're going to find something that finally works. You're going to find the correct uh, uh, data representation and model that are going to work to give you what you want. Once you do that, you're going to deploy it. But it's continuous circle. You're going to continue to deploy and uh, working to improve the system. So this is the CRISP DM. Again, I ran into this uh, a couple of years ago, and it is older. There are newer ones available. <coughs> this one's from Microsoft. Um, I'm going to give everybody like 20 seconds just to look at this because I'm not going to cover the whole thing. But it's uh, good just to scan it real quick and see see what's on there. All right. All right, so this one isn't quite the circle that the Crisp DM had. You can see that there's a lot more complexity going on here. I think that the Crisp DM model lent to um, the original concept of the unicorn data scientist that they're just going to come into the organization, they're going to do everything, right? I mean, really, there's only six bubbles. How hard can that be? Here, you have a lot more going on. Um, so you have the data acquisition and understanding. Today, this is represented by a, like a data engineer. They take data and pipe it from different places in the organization to uh, uh, like a repository to, to a place in a s format that the data scientist can work with. Um, the modeling, that's going to be the data scientist arena where you have data scientists that understands how to do those types of things. And you have deployment, which would be like the machine learning engineer. They understand how to take a, like a, like a proof of concept and turn it into an actual product. So there's a lot definitely going on here, and I think that this shows how the environment has changed. How uh, there's a, a lot of more, there's a lot more resources like this available. So everything's evolving, and it's getting, it's becoming much more serious. <clears throat> All right. So what are the common steps? Of course, the business understanding. You need to understand what what you're trying to change and what kind of effect you're trying to make. Um, the data understanding, uh, data wrangling. Those three things, uh, mainly those, uh, the first steps two and three, that's going to be like 90% of the job. Um, getting the data in the correct state, understanding it, what are you going to do to bad data, what kind of like, um, uh, how are you going to alter it for the machine learning algorithms. And then you're going to model it. Uh, modeling, if you're using a library like Psychic Learn or even neural nets, it's not, gonna t it's not that bad to, to pass some data to the, the model and get some sort of result. Um, and then deploying. I've also heard that deploying is 90% of the job. Um, so it's varying, you know, the, and we've seen that as well. It's, it's taken a lot to, to produce like a, syst a serious, reliable um, software that in incorporates machine learning. Um, so these are the common steps between the two. <clears throat> All right, now I want to talk about complexity of a problem. Um, when you're looking at like a machine learning blogs, you're going to run into things where people say, you know, you don't want to swat a simple problem with a, like a massive 100 layer neural net. Uh, similarly, you don't want to you know, have a self-driving car that is being driven by like a linear regression, right? So you want to have an idea of the complexity of the problem. 
You know, I'm going to talk about some examples and uh, what the steps that we have taken um, to get where we are today. Um, and I don't want you to think, wow, these steps shouldn't have been taken. These steps absolutely should have been taken because you don't get an understanding of the data and where you are until you start the more uh, start with the heuristic approaches. And it's important that you do that. So I don't want that to be what you learn today. Uh, I'm going to specifically call out what should be learned. Um, excuse me. <clears throat> So the complexity of a problem. This is supposed to represent like a, like a stairs. You walk into a building, or actually you're in a building, and you see this sign, and there's stairs. You know you need to go up. There's no indication of how many flights of stairs there are going to be, and you can't exit the building to see how many floors there are, right? Um, so you know you need to go upstairs, so you start going. This is how we start a lot of these projects, right? We think, oh, yeah, that sounds easy. I'm gonna, we're going to crush it. This is going to be uh, really easy. But after you've been flying, uh, you know, climbing steps for a long time, you realize, wow, I completely underestimated uh, how challenging this is going to be. I think this happens a lot, and that's absolutely fine. Um, so it's hard, uh, you know. In retrospect, it's easy to say, like, oh, if I would have going to, if I were going to do this today, I would address it differently. You can only do that, and uh, you know, after the fact. So here's. Our initial attempt. We were, uh, like I mentioned, this is a pipeline designed to pull stuff out of uh, unstructured documents. So I have some fake text here. <clears throat> um, this is what you're seeing. You're seeing a bunch of fake text. You're seeing a red uh, date. That's uh, what we would say is important here. And then the green is what we're passing to the model or our first attempt, which is regular expressions. All right. So regular expression, uh, you can Google regular expressions and find a regular expression for dates, but it's going to pull dates out of text. Now, if you want to identify what kind of date that is, you can say, you know, show me the words to the left. If these characters and these word combinations show up in the words to the left, I'm going to call it this type of date. So it definitely works, but as you're working on capturing corner cases, that kind of thing, um, you're going to find these really ugly regular expressions. You're just layering rules on rules on rules, right? But you know what? This is the first attempt. Let's apply heuristics. Maybe it's not as difficult a problem as we're, as we're, as we're thinking. <coughs> Excuse me. So initially, this attempt, we were able to get uh, roughly 80% accuracy um, with, uh, in about two weeks with one developer and one analyst, both attacking the problem. So you're taking a developer that's taking the domain expertise from the analyst and saying, this is what things need to be the left of this to be able to identify this piece of text, right? And then you're trying to capture you know, 20, 30 fields. So it's going to take a while, right? Um, but you know what? We did this. We're super excited about it. It's money, right? Celebrate. Picnic time. Play some board games. Um, which we did. It was well-deserved. I, I think we did a fantastic job. <clears throat> All right. So at this point, we looked back at our business goals and decided, you know what, 80% we were going to want to bring it a little bit more than that, and we want it to be faster. <clears throat> Excuse me. So this is where you go bounce back and forth between modeling and data acquisition. We decided we want to use machine learning. So we're going to try to find that uh, optimal combination of data presentation to the model. And you constantly just bounce back and forth, back and forth, iterate, perform as many ex experiments as you can to find that optimal combination. Uh, at this point, it's a good idea to, to take a step back and see what people are doing in the industry. Because, you know, honestly, the, there, there's a, it's a great environment today. And if you Google what your specific challenge is, somebody else is probably trying to, you know, uh, do the same thing. So you're going to find other people, <coughs> excuse me, what everybody else has done, and then you can kind of lean on that and use that as your starting point. Um, but essentially what we had done here with the uh, regular expression example is we've created a baseline, um, something to beat. Um, if you're doing like a category competition or something like that, you'll get your data set. And if you're doing like a binary classification, you're just going to label everything as a one. And then you're going to say, how do I do if I just say everything is a, is a one? Um, that's kind of what we did here, except regular expressions, we had a much higher baseline to work with, but we knew that we needed to have something to be. All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, uh, random forest. Um, we started with the random forest algorithm. Um, random forest, it's like an ensemble method. You take a bunch of smaller models and then you take a vote to make your classification. Random forest specifically uses decision trees. Um, so to describe a decision tree, say you wanted to know if it's going to be raining in the next hour. You could go outside and say, is it raining right now? Say no, you're going to go down that point on the decision tree. Um, then you could say, how much has the temperature changed within the last two minutes? Take that answer, you're going to split your, uh, split your tree and go a different direction. Um, it's like that. So random force, uh, you know, ensembles a bunch of uh, dumb trees. They prune them. 
So what we're able to do essentially is we're able to give more information to the model. The regular expression was only looking a little bit to the left, maybe a little bit to the right. With random force, we were able to give it much more rich information. Um, we were able to work on uh, tables. So in a table, you'd see uh, the green going up, say, what's the header, what, what's above it? We can say, uh, through feature engineering, we're able to say, what's the word to the left? What's the word to the right? Does this word show up to the left? Does this word show up to the right? Um, what's the font? Is it bold? Um, all kinds of things. I think we ended up with about 150 different features. Uh, we, we, you know, after doing this, we were able to get to roughly 90% accuracy. It took about a week um, to get uh, a handful of fields. We weren't able to do all the fields because in order to identify the point on the document that we wanted to start creating the features, we needed to use regular expressions to identify those. So we were working with like dates, monies, those kinds of things. So the other fields, the more complex fields, those were still some of the, using some of the other methods. So now we're using two different methods. Um, so some are slower, some are now faster, which is good. But we've been able to increase the speed and get better accuracy. You know what? That's money, right? We're excited. Celebrate. We do a lot of celebrating. Um, <laughs> so we celebrate this, have a picnic. Uh, we're very excited about this. <clears throat> Uh, for specific fields, we would use the random forests and the other fields that weren't uh, capable of working through that pipeline, we used the other methods. Okay, so in this initial data modeling stage, what did we learn? Okay, so we're like constantly going back and forth with the random forests. Prepared the data, presented to the model, how are we doing? So you need to separate your model metrics from the end result. Now, if your, your team or your organization it has business metrics that it needs to achieve, right? Well, those are different than the model metrics. Um, so you need to make sure that those are uh, distinct and even better would be to say if my model gets 80% and my end goal is at 90% or whatever, whatever percentage, how do those two correlate together? What do I, how much do I need to increase my model to affect my business goal? You need to respect train, validation, and test sets. Um, if you don't know what these are and you're interested in machine learning, you'll likely run into this in the first tutorial that you find online. But it's important that when you're working with a bunch of people that maybe don't speak the same vocabulary as you, that you share that vocabulary and everybody knows what, uh, what they are. And basically what you do is when you're working with machine learning, you take your data and you partition it three times. The bulk of that is going to be your training data. That's what you train your machine learning algorithm on. You validate its performance on the validation set. And then you continue to iterate on that process by maybe changing the data, adjusting some of the knobs or the hyperparameters on the machine learning model. Um, and you continue to do this until you get optimal performance. And then after you've done this with one model or possibly more, you can see how it's going to generalize with the test data. If you're adding calibration layers, then you're, you probably need to present something more to your, to your model. Um, so in our case, we'd have a, uh, <clears throat> the model would give us an answer and we'd have some sanity checks to make sure it was right. And if it wasn't, then we'd have like an alternate process that we could go through and uh, you know, uh, go down a different path. Uh, if you're doing that, then you know, something's not quite working right. Um, so you should be able to pass more of that information to your model. And when you think you're done and you've uh, you know, celebrated and you've had your picnic, you may just have like a, an untested uh, prototype um, that you're all excited about. But you know what, it's still, it's still worth celebrating because a lot of effort has gone into it. <clears throat> All right, eventually you have to deliver something, whether it's a piece of software or you're delivering like a report or some sort of recommendation. Um, if you're like, you know, your boss has asked you why are customers leaving, you need to give some sort of like a answer to that. You need to be able to say, this is how I arrived at it, so it needs to be reproducible. You need to have maybe your model saved if you use machine learning, because if you do, if you give them a good answer, they're probably gonna want you to do it again next month. Um, so you need to have a system that you've created that's robust enough that you can iterate and do it again. All right, so what did we learn after first deploying the, the random forest? Um, different types of testing are required for machine learning projects. When you're working on software, um, you have like unit tests and end-to-end -end tests, right? To tell you like this function does this and it's gonna do it every time and if it doesn't, it's gonna, it's gonna throw some errors, something's going to happen. With machine learning, uh, you've transferred the importance from uh, you know, in, uh, encoding domain expertise into the, pro into the software, you've transferred that to the data. So the data is absolutely paramount. You need tests on your data. When the data comes into the system, you need to test it. What kind of distributions do your features have? After you transform everything, test it again. After it goes through the machine learning algorithm, you need to test to make sure that uh, the data coming off of the algorithms are correct. You're not giving like one classification to everything. So you need to shift uh, your idea a little bit there to machine learning. Models need to be periodic, periodically refreshed. 
you can't just say, well, this is getting 90%, I'm gonna put it in uh, production and uh, I'm gonna call it, right? You need to know how it's doing. And there was a, like a blog post that I'd read about this guy. He had uh, gone through and uh, set up a bunch of machine learning stuff for uh, organizations. And within a year or two, they started to come back to him and they said, hey, the, our performance is degrading. What's going on? Well, you need to have a way to know how your machine learning models are actually behaving. Um, we're solving this by having a system where we can go in and hand classify these documents. So we can say, we know how it's doing today. We know how it's doing last month. And we can tell whether or not we need to refresh the model. And if we do need to refresh the model, we have that additional training data available. Um, constant metrics, not a snapshot. Uh, that uh, basically covered that. <coughs> All right. <coughs> Excuse me. So iterate until happy. So we decided to go from rainforest to multiple neural nets. We initially talked about just doing one neural net, um, but in the end, we took a step back and we said, how much of this process can we remove? You have the car here, right? That little blue spinny thing is supposed to be like machine learning. Um, if we had just replaced the, the random force model um, with, uh, with a fancy neural net, maybe we would have gotten a little bit boost in performance, but we wouldn't have moved ourselves to the vehicle on the right where you are be able to iterate quickly and move much faster. Um, at this point, we're finding we have all kinds of different problems that we didn't have before because we're able to go so fast that you know, we have much different challenges that we're looking at. <clears throat> So the strengths of doing this, uh, we were able to break down the problem into smaller pieces. Um, that means that we aren't going to have as much data, right? Um, or we aren't going to need as much data, which worked out because we don't have you know, millions of uh, data points. We're having to hand train or hand classify all these. Let's see, and this is where we ended up. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. So we have a call it a retrieval model. Essentially, it's a multi-label model that tags important areas in the document. So you have a text document. Think, again, HTML or like a PDF. And we have a, a rich data set available that says, this block of text is all the same. And this is a table, right? So it's going to pass it to the retrieval model. And the retrieval model is going to label it. It's going to say, these pieces of information are in it. All right? And it's going to go onto the table. And it's going to say, I believe these pieces of information are in this uh, area of importance. It's going to go to the next one. It's going to say nothing is here. Some of these documents are like 200 pages long. This acts as a filter and a way for us to identify conceptual things that, that aren't facts that we can pull out. And then that, uh, the areas of importance are then passed to an extraction model. Uh, what this does is this goes through every single piece of uh, every word uh, in that area of interest. It's going to tag it and say this is money. This is nothing. This is nothing. This is a date. These five things, this is an entity. And I want you to consider that as one thing within this area of importance. This uh, gives us anchors, right? Um, similar to using the <coughs> regular expressions, we needed an anchor to be able to identify this is something that's important. Let's do the feature engineering around it to show the model what's available. And we pass these areas, like a date, as I showed, to the validation model. A validation model is like essentially the classif classification. It says, okay, you told me this is a date. I'm telling you it's this type of date, okay? So how did this work out? So before, we saw that we're slowly passing more and more of the information to the machine learning model, right? Now we're, we're passing all of it through a different combination of, uh, you know, just passing the text. Neural nets are incredible. They can accept a lot. Um, so we have the date, and we're just passing all of it. Same thing if we had a table. We're, we're passing the whole thing to the machine learning model. Through the layers, it identifies what's important. Uh, through initial tests, this isn't quite, uh, we aren't quite done with this yet. We're still working at it, but the initial tests have found that we were able to get to 95 and higher accuracy. And I have a four hours with, a, with an asterisk, uh, but it, we've been able to identify that uh, this isn't for field, this is for like a whole document type. Um, so this is through a document type we're looking at. Somebody said, can you guys parse these? We looked at it and they were all fairly similar. So it is something you probably could have done with the, with the heuristic. Um, we said, let's see how we can do on this. It took about four hours. I went through and I hand scored these documents. We passed the models. How's it doing? It does fantastic, right? So what do we do? We celebrate. It's money, right? <laughs> Go get some pizza, play a game of Smash Up. This is awesome. Celebrate our, our deep learning pipeline. Uh, and again, it was well deserved, as, are, as were the other steps. So we couldn't have gotten here today without those other steps to learning um, all, all the things that we learned along the way. <clears throat> 
All right. So what do I want you to walk away with? Machine learning is fantastic. Um, what we've been able to do here, we did with basically off the shelf stuff. Uh, re reading other people's tutorials, take a step back, see what ever others in the industry are doing. They, they you know, uh, get insight and get inspiration from other people's blogs and take things that are, for the most part, off the shelf and combine them in such a way that you create something that's super powerful. But you have to do it and so you have to be smart about it, right? And I showed that we had some, some learning, a learning curve. That's fine to learn this stuff on the job. Not everybody, you know, not every team is going to be created immediately with a bunch of data scientists and engineers and stuff like that, uh, machine learning engineers. And I want you to walk with, if you're interested in machine learning, start looking at all those resources that are available. There's plenty, and they are in an absolutely fantastic state right now. Um, Python and Psychic Learn, you have like a whole library that has everything at your fingertips that you can work with. All right, so these are some of our favorites. I wanted to put these up here. Uh, Multi-threaded is the developer um, uh, data science blog for Stitch Fix uh, at uh, the Clearwater Machine Learning Club. We had a session where we talked about uh, one of their blog posts, how uh, anybody that's familiar with machine learning or neural nets, uh, there was like a word to vec. They've created a document to vec. So you can say, I want this dress plus summer. So you can do like addition with clothing. It's awesome, right? Inspiring. And we want to be able to do something like that. I'm thinking like there's all kinds of different cool things you can do with that. So through efforts like this, through Clearwater's uh, the development conference that we've done a couple years now, and this year we're really opening up to, to people outside of the organization. I'm thinking, you know, I, I like to think of this as our, you know, hello world to this to provide, you know, uh, some things that we've done and to provide, uh, to give back to the community. We, and I think that it's fantastic. I would love it if we had our own uh, like development data science blog. I'm kind of pushing for that. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think that this is fantastic. Um, and I am going to have, uh, I think, quite a bit of time here for questions. Um, I'm going to have some links up here. Uh, Mis Machine Learning Style Guide. This is a Google document. It gives you the, uh, the initial vocabulary that you're going to want uh, when you're working with machine learning. And very quickly in the document, they state, um, start with heuristics. Start with something simple. Because in, in the end, you want your model complexity to be uh, maybe slightly under the complexity of the problem or slightly over. But you don't want it to be too much on either side. So you don't want to start with a super uh, complex uh, solution when you start. There's a machine learning rubric for ML production systems. Um, I was all excited when I was reading this document, thinking we were going to slay it. Um, it, didn't, it didn't turn out very well. <laughs> so we incorporated a lot more tests, a lot more things that we can do to, to make sure that we've created a super robust and uh, reproducible machine learning system. And if at any point today you thought, you know what, Jason, um, I could do that better, or I think I could add to that, I have a careers link here. You know, uh, Reach out and let us know because Maybe this year you could be up here talking about like a recommender system or an anomaly detection system that you've been uh, been able to work on and that you're super proud of. All right, well I'm gonna leave these up. I think I'm quite short on time, but that's fine. I'm gonna leave it open for questions. So um, I thought it was great that you decided to use more than one net to do that um, classification. Basically, it sounded like you. Process for breaking uh, the text down into just massive inputs. So I'm assuming your nets had just a massive number of input nodes. Is that correct? <coughs> the question is, uh, does do the neural nets have a massive amount of input nodes? And they do. Um, we worked with uh, character tokenization. I ran into this. I was looking uh, at a Kaggle competition for. Uh, multi-label, uh, it was a toxic classification, a toxic comment classification. Um, and that's where I ran into the, the model, the retrieval model. Um, so yeah, so I think it's like 3,000, um, I believe is where we landed on that. Um, so like 3,000 would be the input and those are characters. Um, so we did have to limit it a little bit. Um, through the representation that we had for our data, um, it's actually a software that Clearwater is open sourced. Um, to be able to take a document and create a rich uh, representation of that data. So you can have like a character and I'll say here's like the error, here's where it is on the page. So you can reconstruct that in such a way that you can use it for machine learning. Does that answer your question? Yeah, very well. In fact, uh, I'm glad
glad you said open source. What, what was your architecture then for those networks? I mean, how many hidden layers? What, how, how big were they? In, in so I can't get too much into it because there's like a like an IP concern, right? Okay. Uh, but um, for the most part, a uh, uh, combination of uh, convolution networks, uh, LSTMs, and honestly, they none of them were that deep. Um, this is, you know, when you think like a deep learning like ImageNet, it's like a, like 109 layers or something like that. This is not that. Um, but we didn't, we don't need as much data. Um, the deeper you go, the more data you need. So you did do some convolution pre-processing to feed the net? Uh, as part of the layers, there's convolution, convolution layers. Okay. So like uh, with the image recognition, right? So convolution, it's the box that goes around the image to help start pulling out those features to identify edges and stuff like that. You can do the same thing for text. Okay, nice. Did you run into any issues with overfitting in terms of like regular? Absolutely, absolutely. And one of the models has, uh, oh, excuse me. Um, uh, the question was, did we run into problems with overfitting? Um, absolutely. So with uh, regularization, some of the models actually have like a 80% like dropout. That's where you um, you create the features for the machine learning model, and you have your network nodes set up, and then you prune a dramatic amount of them, so that as uh, the the weights are moving throughout the uh, the network, um, you can ensure that all of the weights, the weights that wouldn't have been affected before, are going to be affected because you're removing enough of the the different the different weights um, that you can ensure that all the weights are going to get some sort of change as it's training. That answer. Can you clarify what the like durations were for each of the different models you ran? Like you had two weeks, one week, four hours. What does that refer to? Okay. Uh, so what that is is a developer analyst pair. Uh, initially, we called it uh, tribes or something like that, right? Uh, we would have a developer and analyst uh, that the uh, analyst would go out and research the documents. So we say, we have this document, and your job is to pull this piece of information out of this uh, corpus of documents. And so they would research it, and then uh, they would come back to the developer, and they would say, okay, after reading like hundreds of these documents, I think that this, this is how we're going to be able to find this. So they would communicate with the developer how to do that. And then the developer would create some software uh, using regular expressions or some other means. And then they would uh, work together to test how well, that it, it ha how well it was doing. Um, did I repeat that question? No. So excuse me. The question was, uh, when I showed on the slide the duration, the uh, number of weeks, um, and the accuracy, um, what did that represent? Um, so as we're going throughout the process, we found that we're able to you know, reduce that time. Um, by using just smarter things. Basically, what we ended up doing is we transferred uh, the domain expertise instead of trying to give it on the front end by uh, transferring the domain expertise to the data. Uh, what that allowed us to do is to have a large training set that when I give the example of the, like the four-hour one, we used all of the training that we used for the random forests and the other models for that. If we were trying to train that document alone, it would have taken much longer. So we're able to basically incorporate transfer learning. Did you, uh, when you were training your nets, did you have much trouble with your machines crashing? Uh, yeah, when I was training it locally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, for the most part, we ended up transferring a lot of our learning tasks to the Google Cloud. Yeah, because it's just so much better. faster. Yeah, yeah, you can use GPUs. Um, so instead of taking, you know, like a day, it's going to take like an hour. Um, so you spin out that job, and it's worked out pretty well. Good to know. But yeah, I excuse me, your question again. I'm horrible at this. I have a note <laughs> to remind me of this, and I knew I was going to forget it. The, the question was, <clears throat> uh, did, do you find that your computer was crashing during, during training? Uh, absolutely. Uh, I have, like... I don't know, like 16 gig on my computer, and I, I kill it all the time. Um, but yeah, that's why we transferred that, uh, transferred these specific tasks to to the cloud because it just works much better. Um, so we got a you know budget approved for that. Yeah, it's amazing. It, it, you know, a reasonable size network won't crash your machine, but then you try to start cross validating and ouch. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Once you incorporate, you know, a lot of data with a sophisticated model. 
it can it can cause problems to your computer. So I find that a lot. Sometimes I'll kick off a job like at the beginning of the week because um, we restart the computers here on the weekends. So I want to make sure that I have enough time to. And it's generally, I'll, it'll kill my computer sometimes. So it happens. All right. So here we have five minutes. Any more? Any more questions? So I've been thinking about, uh, excuse me, what are the minimum specs for a computer for machine learning? I've been thinking about this a lot because um, I'm looking at buying a computer. Um, so the minimum spec, if you're going to be using something from like Scikit-Learn, like a regular like machine learning library, it's not too much. You need to be able to fit the data into memory, generally, is a good rule of thumb. So if you're working with reasonable size data sets um, that are maybe like uh, two gigs, you probably want like four gigs of RAM. Um, for a neural net, you're gonna, it's going to be processor speed. But anymore, I'm looking at computers. I'm looking at cheap computers. I'm just going to toss everything to the cloud. It's cheap. You sign up for like Google. They give you $300. I'm still working on my $300. Um, so you can just spin up jobs with them. And uh, you know, I think in the end, it's going to be like $10 or $15 a month for what I do. Uh, personally, at work, we you know, use a little bit more than that. But. <laughs> Does that answer your question? Good? All right, fantastic. Thank you, everybody. There's a lot of great talks today. Enjoy, enjoy yourself. <laughs>